Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We are bringing the VRIC to you each and every week with our series of expert online panels. And we have another great one lined up for you today. I've got Tony Greer, editor of The Morning Navigator, and Jared Dillian, editor of The Daily Dirt Nap, with me today. We're going to be getting their view on the markets, the economy, commodities, and much more. Gentlemen, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having us, Jesse. Thanks. Thank you. Well, let's start with the trends and themes you're currently watching when it comes to the broad market and the economy. This is a broad question. Take it wherever you'd like. But what do you think investors should be paying attention to right now that may be not out there in the in the financial media so much? And Jared, I'll start with you. Yeah, actually, um, you know, every you know, you said the things that people aren't paying attention to, and I think everybody's paying attention to gold. So I'll just leave that out of it for a second. Um, you know, we've we, you know today is. Uh, Monday, April 15th, it's the day after the weekend of the uh, attack on Israel of Iran. And I think on Saturday when the attack happened, everybody was expecting um, the market, the stock market to be, you know, two or three percent lower and gold to be higher. And and actually just the opposite happened. Stocks are higher. You know, what's interesting is that the bond market is getting annihilated um, across the curve, especially in the front end. Um, twos are, uh, up seven basis points today. And it, I, I think, you know, it's, you know, what's kind of interesting is that I think the risk reward of getting long bonds is getting better. Um, we've just about priced out all of the rate cuts that we had priced in. And, um, I think, I think at some point we're going to be pricing in rate hikes, which is pretty incredible. Um, so I think the risk reward is getting better. Twos are at 496, 497. So getting back up to about 5%. Um, so that's what I'm looking at this morning. And yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned that over the weekend, Twitter was ablaze with all sorts of opinions on what was going to happen. There was some gold back crypto or something that, that shot up for a while and people were sort of pointing to that and saying, well, this is maybe what the gold market's going to do. It does seem like business as usual, though. Tony, your thoughts on on what you're currently watching in the markets and the economy? Uh, yeah, you know, all kind of the same trades and reactions as Jared, really. You know, it's all about the rates markets and commodities markets. My, my big trade of late is that you've got to make sure that you pivot into Having commodity risk on, whether it's in the commodities or in expressed in sector ETFs, um, you know I'm a big trend follower, and when I see like the sort of seven month losing streak in the BCOM end against the backdrop of like RISM popping back up over fifty and the kind of recession fades fearing and the commodity complex waking up. You know, to me, that's a sign that we've got a, you know, that there's a little bit of shift in leadership in the market taking place as rates grind higher. I think that higher rates are kind of giving the green light go to the inflation trade at the for the time being. And, and kind of on the other side of the bond discussion is Jared. I kind of think that they can go a little bit lower first because i think that we're going to see a few more crescendos in commodities that are going to kind of keep rates percolating on the upside a little bit more so we're kind of looking at the same thing i i would have expected similarly a pullback in equities that is just not happening it seems like you know one of the more resilient secular equity bull markets that we've been in for a while and you know i'm, I'm prepared to trade a pullback which i think is something you know we kind of had a short discussion before this conversation, Jesse, but a lot of people are looking for a major curl over in the stock market. And I kind of think that that's not paying attention to the tailwinds that the market has and the stability of the curve and some of the other things that it's got going for it. So that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. I wanted to touch on a tweet you made to that same effect where you said, when I tweet about the SMP, I get a lot of comments about when the rug pull will be. I do not know what planet these people are on, 
or what market they are watching. Um, there does seem to be a chorus of voices out there pounding the table saying the S&P is massively overvalued as being held up by a handful of tech stocks. The whole thing's going to come down like a house of cards. Every, you know, there's it's crazy to invest in, in the S&P. Um, do you, you seem to have a differing view. What are you seeing um, in regards to the broad market? And um, what? Why is there this chorus of voices out there calling for for an imminent crash? Yeah, I guess Jesse, that's my kind of frustration. In my, that that tweet expresses my frustration in uh, so many players in the market that have this view of the world that there's going to be a rug pull, right? And to me, that insinuates that there's somebody jacking the market up in the first place and then there's somebody else or the same person or the same player that's going to pull the rug out from all of the players that it led into this market like that's some kind of a wildly inefficient conspiratorial crazy world that these people live in and i kind of try to stay anchored in reality and when i see markets functioning the way i think markets were built to function you know, as a reflection of interest rates and commodities and asset classes and where money gets treated best. I mean, when I see things that on the screen that make a lot of sense to me during this bull market, I just get frustrated entertaining stories about, hey, when are they going to pull the rug? I don't think that there's somebody out there looking to pull the rug. I really don't. I think that markets trade as a basis of money going where money is treated best. And I just don't think that there's somebody behind a big scam going on. That that's kind of just what the point that I wanted to make, I guess, with that tweet that may or may not have come across properly or not. You could ask JD his per, his opinion on it. I don't know. Yeah, Jared, I would like to to get your thoughts as well on on the broad market and also from both of you too. Uh, you, uh, Tony, you said you see a secular bull market in equities at the moment. Um, so maybe I'll stick with you for a moment and then and then go to Jared. You are more of a shorter term trader, correct? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. So how do you see the setup for both the S&P and the NASDAQ right now? Do you think that these markets are generally overvalued? You know, obviously, whatever that means, that there's a bunch of different metrics that you can look at. But that is what peop a lot of people are saying. You're seeing this message out there. So what are your thoughts uh, on how you see both the NASDAQ and the S&P unfolding, let's say for the remainder of 2024? Yeah, so I'll I'll try to wrap this up in as tidy a box as I can. You know, I am a short-term trader. My view on the S&P being bullish is a sort of longer-term view over the next several years. That's because I see the markets that look to me a lot like 94-95 transition where in 94 we found a peak in Fed funds and the Fed managed a really narrow range in Fed funds for the next 5 years. We had tech tailwinds in the S&P up and left the building. And while I don't think it's necessarily going to be that fast or the same kind of ride or that smooth, I see the similar type of situation being created in the equity market. So I'm kind of a longer term equity bull. I think that there are the tech tailwinds of artificial intelligence and NVIDIA and the semiconductor story, et cetera, et cetera, that are going to make this rally look a little bit like the 95 early stages of the dot-com rally. And I think it can continue. So that's that's my bull case for the stock market. And Jared, do you see things playing out the same way? Is there anywhere where you differ on on Tony? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm a little bit more of a long term trader, um, right? You know, uh, like for me, a, a, like a short term trade would be six to twelve months, and I tend to trade longer term. Um, you know, what's funny is we've actually had a decent amount of rotation out of tech and into other stuff. It's been kind of quiet. People haven't really been talking about it. Uh, you know, NVIDIA hasn't made a new high in a while and um, Google fell apart that made new highs and Apple is kind of a mess. Um, so, you know, the I think the Magnificent Seven story is, I mean, at a minimum overdone and, and might be over. Um, you're seeing new highs in energy. You're seeing new highs in basic materials. So I think there is there's a little bit of a rotation starting, um, you know, and commodities. I mean, you've seen um, orange juice go parabolic. You've seen cocoa go parabolic. Uh, gold has gone parabolic. But you really haven't seen participation from the entire commodity complex yet. Uh, what I'm really waiting on is ags. 
um, you know, the grains, corn, wheat, beans, um, stuff like that. Um, you know, copper is perking up a bit. Um, coffee looks like it might make a big bull run, but, um, you know, I think, I think we are, you know, I think Tony was right. The, um, you know, the, the blue, the commodity index bottom seven months ago, and I think it's in a bull market, um, but you haven't had that broad participation yet. And maybe you get it when we start coming to the realization that inflation is reaccelerating and deficits are out of control and there is a possibility that we'll have to monetize the debt you know the election is coming up um if biden gets reelected i don't think that deficits are going to go down i think they go up even more you're talking about even more issuance you're talking about higher interest rates um so that could be the catalyst for capping the yield curve i mean this is these are the things i think about i look out like two three four years in the types of things that could happen um but for sure you know bullish on commodity short term medium term long term very interesting i do want to touch on a tweet you made as well recently where you wrote sometimes i wonder if the turtle traders were actually good or if they were just beneficiaries of the big commodity bull run of the early 80s if we do get another huge commodity bull run you are not going to want to miss it be a turtle trader now i had to look up turtle traders after reading that could you explain what the turtle traders were uh, for those who aren't familiar, and also, do you expect a huge commodity bull run here? I think you kind of alluded to that. Um, do, do you expect something similar to the run of the early 80s? Yeah, I mean, so the turtle traders, there was a guy named Richard Dennis in the late 70s, early 80s, who famously turned $5,000 into $100 million trading commodities. And he wanted to prove the point that he could teach anybody how to trade. And basically they were trend followers. I mean, they were like the first trend followers. And all of these guys, they called them the turtle traders. Um, all of these guys just killed it. This was in the early 80s when commodities were ripping. And, you know, I said that, I'm like, were these guys good or were they just in the right place at the right time? And I think, you know, I think there's a little bit of both. But, you know, if you're trading in the futures markets, um, you know, basically it's, you can really make, you know, triple digit gains, outsized gains. If you're long a commodity and you're using a specific amount of margin and it goes up and more margin gets, more money gets deposited in your account, then you can kind of pyramid off of that and use the excess margin to take even bigger positions. And if if you ride a trend, I mean, you know, you can do what Richard Dennis did. Um, so, you know, I've been kind of waiting for that type of environment for really my entire career. You know, when you, when you have a sustained bull market and commodities and you can trend follow and you can do something like that, you know, that, I mean, that would be, that would be huge amounts of fun. And, you know, you're, I think you're starting to see it. So. And Tony, you mentioned you follow trends. That's kind of one of your main trading strategies. Are you seeing the same sort of, some are calling it a commodity super cycle, some are calling it a shift from you know what many are pointing to as overvalued tech, as we discussed earlier, into commodities. You're saying you see kind of a longer term bull run happening in the broad market as well. Do you see both the broad market and commodities going up together? Uh, how, how do you see the whole commodities picture at the moment? Yeah, so just to to be a little uh, to be more clear on what I want to convey is that I just want to make sure that people are like what I'm trying to tell my clients is to, you know, I'm pointing out what changed in the commodity markets through the sort of first quarter, second quarter turn. And my point is simply that you want some natural resources exposure for this leg of the S&P rally. Now, this leg of the S&P rally, if it is not led by MAG7 and NVIDIA going to $1,000 a share, is probably going to be much more sideways and orderly than, you know, I guess the last couple of months have been, which have been, you know, kind of, you know, full bull market months for the S&P and for the NASDAQ. 
Um, so what I think that we see is a rotation of leadership where, you know, energy stocks, metals and mining stocks come alive and they start to put up, you know, better performance than the mag seven than semiconductors than social media and some of those sectors, cybersecurity, which have been roaring right through the first quarter of the year. And maybe those don't perform as well. And maybe if the big cap stocks still have a couple of problems with them, Mag7 is kind of oversubscribed and a thing of the past. Maybe that's sideways to lower and natural resources are better bid. And what does that net net mean for the S&P? A slower rally than we've seen, a more frustrating sideways grinding rally than we've seen because you're going to have tech weight and you're going to have the smaller parts of the market that are buoying to the top like energy and metal. So I think it's just a shift of leadership and a kind of a nuance that I want to pay attention to within the bull market. Very interesting breakdown. I, I love hearing different people's perspectives on the market. Um, let's talk about gold. Jared, you brought it up. You said it's kind of top of mind for a lot of people. Um, obviously, all-time highs, sustained, a bit of a pullback recently, but things seem to be back off to the races again in terms of a potential grind to another all-time high. Um, what does this rise in the price of gold say about the overall economy? Um, do you expect this trend to continue? How high could gold go here, in your opinion? Well, I think uh, I think in the short term, we're probably about... 10 trading days away from a tradable top. And I think that's going to come somewhere in the 2,500s. Um, and, you know, I'm a long-term holder of gold under the monetization theory. I think it can go a lot higher. But at some point in the next two weeks, I am going to hedge. Um, I don't think right now this moment is the right time to hedge, but I think there will be a time to hedge. Um, and... I'm going to fully hedge the position and try to insulate myself from what could be a 10% drawdown, right? And when I say 10% drawdown, it could go from 2,500 to 2,200, you know? Um, it's actually, it's funny, like I have a chart of gold up right now. And uh, yes, after Iran attacks Israel, gold is now down on the day. So, you know, it's fantastic. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Tony, your your thoughts on the gold market? Do you think we're in a bull market for gold right now? Um, and and how does that correlate to the broad economy? If if you have any thoughts there as well? Yeah, gold is its own beast right now, right? I'm not looking at gold as a correlation to the economy. You know, gold's got a lot of different buyers that at all time highs, which is a really interesting situation. You know, there's futures and CTA buyers. There's trend following fires, there's pension fund buyers, there's sovereign wealth funds, central banks, all buying gold at all time highs here. So for me, yeah, it's impossible to be sort of bearish gold, but I like looking at it like Jared, like a trader and saying, if we want to make money, we can be bullish, but we should be less long at the highs at certain times. And I'm kind of in that mode right now where, um, you know, I just against the backdrop of seeing, you know, on Friday, gold was sitting at $2,400 an ounce and your Twitter feed was just literally everybody exploding over the new high and the new handle. And gold broke through 2400 It traded to 2430 and then right back below 2400 again. And I, have, I was caught myself high-fiving with Harris Kupperman because when gold got above that 2400 level, all commodities just went right to their highs, like out of respect. Oil was trading at its peak at 87.50, and everything was in the commodity complex was bid. And then all of a sudden, oil I mean, gold gives back 2400, and the whole complex tumbled over. So, in my opinion, when everybody is so frothy on Twitter, that may have been the short term high. So, I made a sale up there in that reversal 
price action and got myself pretty much trapped flat from a trading perspective. Now, I can still believe that gold is going up. I still own precious metal. I still have physical metal. I still have allocations in longer term accounts. But as a trader, the one thing that I always pay attention to is is the response from Twitter because it's the best sentiment indicator out there. And I'll say that this still happens. When I tweet bullish the stock market, I get shoes thrown at me and kicked in the face and spit on. And when you say anything bullish gold, 500 likes, 300 retweets, you know, every new followers, the whole thing. So to me, that's part and parcel that the gold market sentiment is pretty much red line positive. And if you're high-fiving with one hand because you're long, I always recommend making sales with the other hand because it usually works out. So that's how I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, very well said. And I'll, I'll stick with you uh, as we switch to silver now, um, awakening from a long sideways consolidation and uh, now outperforming gold on a percentage gain term this year. What, how do you see the silver market at the moment? Are, are, are you long-term bullish? Which one you want to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, silver. You know, I want to. Silver is a case where I I, ha, I own physical silver too, so I am kind of you know a, a natural born metals, precious metals bull. I feel like people are buying silver because it's cheap and cheaper than gold, and they expect silver to some point sort of catch up performance wise. And meanwhile, I think that the real dynamic. The real commodity trading at an all-time high with all kinds of interesting buyers and stories attached to it is gold. So for me, I want to make sure that I'm in the arena where it's going on and I'm kind of avoiding the silver arena, which I, I may be rooting for. I hope it goes up. With my money for my dollars, I'm just a lot less sure of that money, and I don't want as big an, alloc uh, an allocation in the silver casino where I feel like gold is still a real gold trade. That's my only view on silver. And Jared, your thoughts on the silver market at present? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Right? Can we not care? Can we please not care about some things? <laughs> um, no, but I think I think even that's like, I think that's kind of a sentiment, sentiment indicator, right? Like, uh, you know, like not caring about silver. I mean, it's been, it's underperformed for so long. And um I mean, the thing I always say about silver is that it's a right tail asset, right? It's an asset that does nothing 99% of the time and 1% of the time it explodes 200% higher, you know, which is kind of a, a good asset to have in your portfolio, like just from a, you know, from a risk reduction perspective. So I, I also own, um, silver miners, physical silver, some SLV. It's not a huge percentage of my portfolio. I mean, yeah, the run up to 28 bucks has been pretty nice. Um, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like Missouri. I'm kind of like, show me, you know, when it comes to silver, like get it above 300, 330 bucks, maybe 32, 35. And then we can start talking about pressing bets. So and are there any other commodities at present um, that are catching your eye from a pers potential presenting a potential opportunity? Um, energy, the the oil and gas sector. Any thoughts there? Um, base metals such as copper, nickel, et cetera, or or anything else that that you're watching, Jared. You mentioned agricultural commodities earlier, um, so I'll I'll go to you first. I think I covered everything. I think I I covered all that stuff. They, I, um, I don't think I left anything out. So. Tony, your thoughts and, and anything else that you're watching right now? Yeah, I think copper deserves at least a, a, a little bit of a mention because, you know, number one, it's kind of breaking the the sort of middle the middle quarter of the range, into, breaking into the top quartile of the range, if that's okay to say, like above 9,500, there's room for it to trade towards the high, all-time highs of 11K and the SM, LME, right? So if we break that 9,500 range, there's room to test that high. And, you know, it's it's copper has had the bullish story of, you know, having the whole pivot to electronic vehicles behind it, low inventories behind it. It was really backward dated years ago when it was trading at the highs and everybody thought it was going to explode. Then it went into this period kind of like silver where it lulled everyone to sleep. And I like to bring up the comment that I heard by Paolo Macro on the market hub when he said that, you know, 
Hopper's breakout is going to be a function of how long it sort of led investors to leave it alone and and kind of just lull everyone to sleep. And so that that sounds relevant to me that it sounds finally now where like, you know, like Jared said, like nobody cares about silver. It's hard to get people to care about copper. Maybe now it finally goes as the whole rest of the commodity complex wakes up. But at least that one looks like it's got some technical potential and XME metals and miners look good on the charts and Freeport is looking like it can break out. So I just feel like you have to keep half an eye on that in case like silver that sort of, you know, gets explosive out of the blue. I think that might be a trade that's sustainable for some portion of this year. So I, I have uh, that really high on my radar screen. And any thoughts on emerging markets at present? I've spoken to a lot of people who are very bullish. I'm wondering if you see things the same way. Jared, last time I, I chatted with you, we talked about China and you said you think that country is basically uninvestable, um, which I which I tend to agree with actually, but looking very undervalued if, if we look at the charts. Um, any countries in particular you think that could be positioned to outperform the broad market ahead and just thoughts on, on emerging markets overall, Jared, I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, I'm a big India bull, and I was an India bull before it became consensus, and now it's consensus, and uh, it's on the highs, and it's kind of consolidating around the highs. I mean, it's the best demographic story. It's the best political story. It's the best deregulation story. It's the best technology story. Um, I, th I think you buy India and just don't even look at it for five to 10 years and it's going to be fantastic. Um, but I mean, you know, emerging markets broadly, um, you know, dollar is up again today. It's kind of tough for EM to do well in that environment. Um, but you know, I think, I think EM X, the bad stuff X China X, you know, Brazil, um, looks pretty good. So and Tony, have you been watching emerging markets? Um, do you feel the same way about India? Are there any countries that you'd point to perhaps that you think present opportunity in terms of equities there? No, I, my ears are wide open. I, I don't disagree with anything. I have no views at all um, on any countries outside of the U.S. at the moment. I feel that the U.S. markets are functioning so properly and sending such good signals um, that I don't really need to move any dollar investment or trading dollar off of our continent for any reason. The US markets are virile, behaving like beautiful tactical trading markets. There's breakouts galore to trade. I'm going to stick with my sectors and uh, keep plowing through the year that way. Well, let's discuss now some asset classes that both of you think are better avoided. Um, Tony, I'll, I'll go to you. Is there anything right now that, that you think, any sectors, any asset classes, that you think have a very bearish setup at the moment. Hmm. And now, you know, I'm a bull market trader, so I'm always hunting for things that trade from the bottom left to the top right of my screen. Jesse, yeah. to be totally honest with you, you know, if you have to notice a market in a, in a bear trend, it's natural gas, which is probably not going to last forever. Um, you know, that's just one of the commodities where all of a sudden, you know, there's plenty coming out of the taps and out of the shale, and then all of a sudden there's none. You know, so that's kind of a market to keep an eye on where if it keeps going down, all it is is sort of like uh, a tax cut for the corporation, right? Cheap energy is good for industrials. And so that's how I look at that market. But I mean, I don't really look at, at the world right now as markets that I should stay away from or anything like that. If anything, like it looks like there might be some risk in Bitcoin. Um, if it doesn't emphatically kind of break through the 70K level, it looks like maybe it pulls back to 50 or 60k 50k or something like that but and that's a dip that i probably like to buy too so yeah i don't really have any markets that i'm you know i've got uh do not trade or stay away from because they're gonna collapse or anything like that well being a bull market trader what asset categories maybe outside the commodity space other areas you're looking right now other bull trends that you're seeing Stocks and commodities, you know, that we just had a fresh energy breakout. We've got a fresh home builder, home construction breakout to all time highs. Those are the sectors that I'm watching. Uranium is a really compelling bull case. Um, I'm more interested in the commodity than the miners there because I think that's where the trade is. I keep that COP, COP 20, 26, um, you know, goal in mind of sort of tripling nuclear capacity by 2050. And I think that's a long term trend that you can stay in if your position size is right and and be able to weather a little bit of volatility there 
So those are the markets. You know, I'm really bullish gold at new all time highs. I'm bullish energy stocks at all time highs. I'm bullish home construction is a secular trend that continues to buck off the rate rising. And so, you know, I feel like there's so much to stay focused on within the U.S. that, man, I feel like those breakouts are, are really, really tradable. And that's where I've got all my attention right now, Jesse. And Jared, same question for yourself. Areas that you're bearish on that you think are better left uh, on the sidelines and uh, anywhere else that you're you're bullish when it comes to the market at present? Um, well, you know, we haven't talked about Argentina. Argentina has been a fantastic trade for me and my newsletter. Um, we were really early um, on identifying Javier Malay as, you know, was probably going to be the next president of Argentina. And that's been, that's been triple digit gains in that trade. And that's, that's worked out great. Um, continue to be bullish there. That's another one like India. You just, well, at least you put it away until the next election. I can't predict what's going to happen in the next election, but for, for three and a half years, that should be a good trade. Um, stuff to avoid. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the cattle chart, live cattle. Um, that's had a multi year bull market and it's put in some, uh, lower lows and lower highs. Um, but aside from that, no, I don't think so. And uh, for the average retail investor out there, um, obviously both you guys have a ton of experience in the markets. For somebody who maybe just wants to protect their wealth, Jared, I know you you wrote a book to this effect, No Worries, I believe how to live a stress-free financial life. Um, for your average person out there who doesn't have all the time to research the markets, there it is, yes. Um, what is the best way to preserve one's wealth and, and maybe also make some profit along the way? Well, this is, I mean, this has been a trading conversation. We're all, you know, we're all traders here. We're talking about trading, um, you know, for the, the average person, um, probably you shouldn't be listening to what we're saying at all. Probably you should be doing <laughs> yes. something else. Um, <laughs> you know, in my book, I talk about the awesome portfolio, which I think is the solution to long-term investing. It's 20% stocks, bonds, gold, cash and real estate and you rebalance it annually. And the amazing thing about the awesome portfolio is it returns about 1% less than the stock market, but you get half the volatility. And who would not make that trade? You know, who would not do that? And that's that's going back to 1971. So and Tony, for those who are listening, even though they shouldn't be <laughs> perhaps yeah. the, the those retail investors who who don't have a ton of time to devote to researching the market what where where do you think is the best place to to be in terms of just let's look at wealth preservation as kind of the the main goal here you're talking about a disciple of the awesome portfolio right here in this window also right like i i learned things from jared and i put them to work and i put money for my kids I called him up years ago and I was like, dude, how do, how do I allocate this? You know, I'm like, I have some long term money and just kind of socking it away. First dollars, you know, for a different, you know, fund for my kids to stuff. He was like the awesome portfolio. And he told me about it. And I put the money in there and I set it up that way for all three of my kids. And I watch it like a hawk because I love the fact that it doesn't go down. Right, Jared? I mean, it's really hard to see dips in this thing. And, and if you've got money in it over time, you're like, man, this works. And so when I put new allocations um, for them in the markets and when I recommend to young kids that are you know, just starting investing, I mean, I kind of tell them to have a little bit more risk on than the awesome portfolio, maybe a little bit more S&P risk, um, a bigger allocation. But yeah, that really works. And so that that's a different trade. That's a conversation than tr tactical trading altogether. But it's something that I've been in and monitored and am totally comfortable sleeping like a baby with large quantities of money in the awesome portfolio at night. So I think that's a good move as well. Great. Well, let, let's end on for those investors who maybe do have more time and who are willing to do the research to evaluate various equities that are out there. I'm wondering what both of your processes are when you look at a company determining whether to invest or not. Tony, obviously I, I'm you're you're more of a short-term trader. I'm wondering if you rely on technical analysis more 
if you rely on fundamental analysis? Do you look at things like PE ratios and things like that? How how do you evaluate companies? I mean, I'm I'm a much better sector trader, but I do kind of allow um, stock picks to find me is kind of the way I look at it. And, you know, and a lot of that is from one of two things, the way that I kind of lead myself into individual games is the sort of practicality of it. You know, I like investing in things that I use all the time, like Costco and American Express and stuff like that. Um, but I'm more the other way that I like to bet on a, a company or even a sector is betting on the CEO. And if, if, if a company I feel like is a sort of clean company positioned well in a sector and I sort of get to know the CEO and his plans and his work ethic and the things that he's working towards. And if that differentiates them from the competition, those are stories that I like as well. But I'm not a huge individual stock investor. And Jared, what about yourself? Do you invest a lot in individual equities? Do you more do the ETF thing? How do you evaluate uh, either an individual company or just a sector before you decide to allocate capital? I do some individual stocks. I'm, I'm not very good at it. I'm not a, a great stock picker. Um, the The returns in my futures account are much greater than the returns in my stock account. Let's put it that way. Um, but um, let me just say that I buy stuff that everybody hates. I buy stuff that people absolutely hate. The first trade I made in my entire life, I had an Ameritrade account, the old Ameritrade in Omaha, right? I had that Ameritrade in 1999, and I bought Philip Morris a couple days before the master settlement agreement, the court case that had them pay $256 billion in reparations to the states. And the stock was trading at 19 bucks. And I sold it at 25 and then it went to 80. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but even more recently, like when people were freaking out about commercial real estate last year during the regional banking crisis, I bought SL Green, right? I bought SL Green at like 19 bucks and wrote it up to the mid 30s. You know, I buy stuff where the negative sentiment is so negative that people say you have to be insane to buy this stuff. And that's the stuff that I buy. So awesome. Well, gentlemen, it's been a fantastic conversation, a ton of insight shared. Uh, before I do let you go, Jared, tell us about your book, uh, How to Live a Stress Free Financial Life, No Worries. And, uh, also, Daily Dirt Nap, if you'd like to, to talk about that as well. Sure. Here's the book. You should definitely get this book. It will change the way you think about money. Came out on January 23rd, so it's been out a couple months now. It's sold really well. Pick up a copy of No Worries. And if you want the daily trading stuff, it's the Daily Dirt Nap. You can get me at dailydirtnap.com. There's a little subscribe button. You send me an email. And if you mention the podcast, then I'll give you a discount. Awesome. And where's the best place to get the book online? Is it is it Amazon? Do you have a website set up for that? Um, there's it, it, Amazon is the it, Amazon's the easiest way. I mean, it is in bookstores. It's in Barnes and Nobles. It's pretty much anywhere books are sold. But Amazon is the easiest for sure. So great. Well, I'll put a link to the Daily Dirt Nap and the book in the description. Tony, tell us about the Mo Morning Navigator. What it is you do there? Where people can find it. Yeah, you can find me the same at tgmacro.com. Um, I don't have trials, but there are samples, um, updated samples of the website on the page. You can find me at Twitter at tgmacro on Substack at tgmacro.substack.com, where I run Navigator TV, where I do some video updates on the markets and interviews with people in the markets. And that's where anyone can find me. Great. I'll put links to that in the description below as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a blast. Thanks Thank for you. having us, Jesse.